kind of huge growth industry for jobs. So just putting it bluntly. So a uh, couple of data points. Most of our hospitals across the country are still at 80 to 95% capacity. And that is largely driven, not just by COVID admissions, but pretty high acuity admissions, average lengths of stay and things like that. What's, what's not necessarily making headlines is really kind of what's been pushed off the table, elective procedures. Number one, I think there's like a misnomer about what people assume elective procedures, they use that word elective and really think that's granularly what it means. Cosmetic procedures are things people don't need. The majority of elective procedures at most larger hospitals, um, not even academic centers, just larger hospitals, uh, with over uh, 150 to 200 beds are actually, you know, cancer surgeries, hip and knee replacements, things that can be delayed, but probably in an ideal setting should not be delayed. They also are some of the drivers for hospital service lines with the greatest margins. So when you lose something that can be both profitable and also help to kind of feed um, a lot of the crank wheels of a healthcare system, that becomes losses that are not sustainable over time. And that's why you saw in March of 2020, you really, I mean, every hospital immediately had to take down elective procedures. But if you'll notice the pattern with subsequent surges, including Omicron, there's been a reluctance to just do away with those procedures. But because of all the capacity that's been taken up by both COVID and non-COVID higher acuity patients or kind of more complex patients, they've had to do it. Add that to the mix of sick workforce uh, at one point, 40% of my clinic staff were out either with COVID or contacts of COVID. And so I was literally one of the last healthy people standing, so to speak, that could come to work. When you mm -hmm. add all of that in, uh, and then the third factor, sorry, I know that you just got, you have very smart journalists. So I, the third factor is really the cost of, everybody's heard it now about the cost of travel nurses. That's gotten a lot of attention, but there are costs for all sorts of other per diem jobs. Respiratory therapists are in incredibly short supply. We've even seen an uptick in costs for um, janitorial staff. And, and the mandates are not the driver of some of those shortages. I think that's been kind of um, over dramatic, kind of there's been a bit more of a dramatic headline for it. It really is a flavor of the great resignation, meaning people are not leaving healthcare, but they are quitting their jobs. And then literally two weeks later, taking the exact same job, but as a per diem and, and people are okay with that. And we're seeing that everywhere. Wow. Um, so back to the uh, elective surgery uh, changes, when do you think those, um, may come back or are they starting to come back? They're now? starting. Yeah. They're starting to come back almost every, even, you know, the whole country is in what, you know, bright red, high transmission, but everybody, uh, you know, just conventionally speaking, most hospital service lines, oncology and orthopedics um, tend to be huge kind of volume and profit margin drivers. So those are examples of service lines where the electives came back sooner rather than later. Not everybody has implemented them back. And by the way, again, it's usually by certain types of procedures or certain departments. Um, but yes, everybody is trying to bring them back for all the reasons I mentioned. And, and I think the other kind of trend or indicator to watch, it's actually funny, I was saying, you know, one of the future indicators, if we get past this kind of pandemic phase into however you want to define endemic, one of the leading indicators that people have looked at is hospital capacity. And I said, you know, that's very important, but you're probably going to see some signals in some of these elective procedures too, because if you start seeing more and more people getting sick, sometimes those are the procedures that get canceled first, because usually to get these procedures, you need a negative test within the previous 24 hours. So I've kind of, you know, encouraged people to look at broader signals so that you can understand what's happening, not just the traditional, you know, heads and beds uh, hospital capacity. Okay. Um, another thing, and, and I've even written about this, is uh, telehealth. Uh, telehealth has uh, grown substantially, was used um, a lot during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering what's happening now um, and what the long-term prospects for telehealth are um, now that we've had this sort of forced experiment going yeah. on in the nation. Right, right. So there's uh, so some really positive developments. I think Pre, prior to the pandemic, there, there are codes and there have been payments for telehealth services, but they were never considered, they were never prioritized and they weren't um, kind of considered in parity 
with like an in-person visit. So you wouldn't get paid for a telehealth visit the same amount for an in-person visit for the same conditions or the same kind of counseling. And that changed with the pandemic. And I think people acknowledge that yes, you can provide quality services through telehealth services, not for everything. And I think that's where the kind of downside is coming in. Um, we know that Medicare and Medicaid, for example, have already said that for um, select behavioral health services and for certain services that they will expect to continue telehealth payments, real emphasis really on kind of behavioral health and some of these like poorly utilized services or things where there's shortages of workforce. But then for commercial insurers, which is most of the country and how we receive insurance, there's still a big overhanging question mark about how commercial insurers will pay once we get out of what the um, HHS state of emergency declaration is. I think there's certain provisions as long as there's a federal state of emergency nationally that commercial insurers have generally followed. They don't have to. So you have already seen some commercial insurers in some parts of the country stop paying for certain telehealth services, but by large, most are still paying for them. And I think the question, what's interesting though, just it, if you look at, again, major hospital systems, everybody, we were almost 100% telehealth March of 2020. We had to pivot to it. I would say that now it's settled down to approximately, depending on what part of the country you're in, 10 to 15% of visits are telehealth. And if you ask the question, like, does that mean that we've identified which 15% should be telehealth and which 85% need to be in person? The answer is simply no. We make more money off of in-person visits because there's you can justify um, some of the complexity that come with an in-person visit, some of the physical exam. And then frankly, we do a lot of ancillary services on in-person visits. I'll do usually, you know, checking someone's diabetes with a rapid test. I'll usually give them vaccines in that visit. And so there is, it, it'll be interesting to see where we settle. Is it gonna be 10 to 15%? And then how do we know what should be a telehealth visit and what should not? And I think the average patient, person, human, they can't make that decision. But if you call and you ask, you know, they'll say, you know, do you want this virtually or in person? Well, how are you supposed to know that? So it'll be interesting to see if some of these like newer startup, you know, there's been so many startups in the telehealth space. If some of them help to reduce some of that friction of trying to figure out, do you need an in-person visit or not? And um, with patients, uh, I know you work for a um, federally qualified health center. Mm -hmm. um, has uh, the advent of more telehealth uh, improved access to care? Yeah, for my patients, there's no question. And I think that's partly why um, it was very nice to hear the administrator for Medicaid and Medicare say, like, we want to make sure that we have telehealth options for both Medicare and Medicaid beneficiaries. And I think that the devil's in the details, right? So um, this summer Congress, uh, Senator Wyden and uh, Thune and some others have already said that like, we're gonna be tackling mental health in a big kind of congressional way, bipartisan bills, et cetera. And telehealth is gonna play a pivotal role in that. I can give you very concrete examples. I have patients, diabetics, um, pregnant women, hypertense people with blood pressure issues, where my ability to get them to follow up with me has been enhanced greatly by offering telehealth visits because it's a non-trivial number of patients who have jobs where getting away does means that they would go without pay. And, and you know, even when I go to the doctor, I park, I wait, it can be a you know, two to three hour process. So I've been able to have patients where I can do kind of a 10 to 15 minute televisit whether it's with video or without um, FaceTime or not, and be able to kind of address like their medications, adherence, refills, kind of, you know, what's going on with other parts of their health. What I can't do is obviously, you know, parts of the physical exam, I'm not going to be able to get a blood pressure reading, but I am hopeful that if this continues, we will find a way even for safety net populations, people with Medicaid or people with what I'll call kind of under insurance that we can find a way to use remote monitoring more successfully. It's, it's kind of in, incredible to me that in 2022, I can't figure out how to get a blood pressure cuff to somebody so that I can have them just doing their own ambulatory monitoring, you know, without having to go through a lot of hurdles and headaches to get that paid for by an insurer. Yeah, for sure.
Um, you mentioned staffing earlier um, in hospitals. I'm also wondering about staffing in uh, long-term care facilities mm -hmm. uh, and how that uh, kind of came to the fore during uh, the pandemic and, and what you expect going forward there. Yeah, so I, um, so it's interesting because long-term care and I think that um, unless you've had to like, you know, family, friend or personal self-experience access it yourself, you have no idea like how kind of crazy it is to, you know, run uh, nursing homes, intermediate like rehab facilities, even home health care agencies um, or home hospice agencies. These are incredibly challenging jobs to hire people for because primarily they're, you know, they're not MDs and nurses. They're depending a lot on um, certified nursing assistants, medical assistants. So much lower on the healthcare wage kind of ladder and a lot more turnover as a result tends to be a lot more women, tend to be women um, from minority populations, even first generation or people who are born in other countries. And the great resignation, if you will, if you look at the data on where there's still been um, drop off and hard to recruit spots, it's been in that long term care home health services, post acute facilities. So I have some I don't I used to work in a nursing home uh, in a former two former lives and I stopped because I was so frustrated as a doctor with how poor the staffing was. There was a turn several de decades ago where they put in pretty strict requirements for staffing ratios, how many nurses need to be on the site, what kind of doctor or um, supervision. That is incredibly, that is getting incredibly tested with COVID because there's just simply not enough bodies to fill these jobs. And it's hard to make, uh, it's hard to make the unit economics of a long-term care facility profitable by doubling the wage, for example. They don't have the bank kind of that, you know, if you will, that a hospital does to try to subsidize some of these efforts. So we are seeing incredible ratios of patients being managed by fewer and fewer staff. And I had a family member, a patient of mine was in um, a post-acute facility and one of her family members called me and said, I don't even know if she's getting fed. And I went, I called the nursing supervisor and I said to her, you know, I'm not trying to put pressure on you, but to give me a sense of what's going on. And she literally, she, someone I've worked with for a while. And I said, she said, doctor, I'm lucky if they get their medications on time and we make sure that, you know, they're in their beds, you know, the, the last thing she's like, I can't take on the responsibility of making sure that the meals get there at certain times. We're just not, we're just not going to be able to do that. And this was about three weeks ago, kind of when we were in our throes of our surge, but I can tell you that that doesn't just improve overnight. And so I do think, and I've kind of challenged congressional people who I used to work with in, on the Hill, like, what is our country? Like, we learned a pretty big lesson, I think, in COVID that the most vulnerable were patients in nursing homes. They're still the large, like one of the largest populations that kind of prone to death, hospitalization. I said, are we going to talk about like a real, like long-term care strategy in this country? And it's crickets, silence. Uh, and it's hard because when I worked for Ted Kennedy, we had kind of a long-term care solution that was, which, you know, got into the Affordable Care Act and then had to quickly get dismantled. I'm, I'm being overly simplistic about it, but it's because it was too damn expensive to actually do what we needed to do for long-term services and supports. But I would argue like what we're doing now isn't working either. So it does feel like um, it does feel like a series of I mean, they're real stories because they're real people and statistics, but it's, it's something that hasn't gotten um, as much surface. Yeah. Um, it also, I remember um, writing about the fact that uh, some of the folks going into nursing homes today were maybe kept in the hospital in years past. So it's yeah. like a higher yes. Me. Acuity. Yeah, they are. Yeah. They're complicated. I mean, this is, and one of the, again, like another, another nursing home where I've got and many nursing homes, by the way, I think, again, if you've never been like, why would you know, they're small the majority of like the plurality of nursing homes in the country, small like places. This isn't like, you know, hospitals with big lights and supply chain and it can be, you know, 10 to 15 beds. And it is, it's a community so these are good people trying to take care. But, you know, one of the nurses said to me, she was like a younger, kind of in her forties, Ethiopian immigrant, really loyal to the job, the employer. 
And she's like, I, I usually need help to kind of be able to turn and lift some patients. She's like, I can't do it by myself. So then they don't lift some of these patients and get them out of bed. And you can see like good intentions and that the downstream effects, not just because of the staffing, but to your point, people are more complicated, you know, and the, and, and the patients are coming in sicker. And then you add to that. She actually said this to me. She's like, how do you guys do it in the clinic? Cause they're, they're having to wear full PPE. And she's like, it's really hard. And I said, I totally agree. I could not get a patient out of bed by myself in full PPE with them maintaining precautions. There's no way I could do it by myself. So I, you know, some very practical issues that still have no solution. Yeah. Um, and now turning to a, a different issue and that is mental health. Um, this has also come really into focus with the pandemic. Um, just in general in the United States, just um, you know, the difficulties um, mm -hmm. dealing with the, the pandemic. Um, but uh, how does this affect the workplace in particular, um, these mental health issues that have come up during the pandemic or are exacerbated by the pandemic? Um, and then how do those kinds of issues affect the healthcare setting and, and healthcare um, you know, as a place of employment? Yeah. So I, um, so a couple of things. Number one, I do think that we've talked about like mental health care being kind of the pandemic of our times before COVID. And it is so obvious to me. In fact, I hope that there's now a, sadly an appreciation globally of how important this is primarily because I can't think of a single human that hasn't been touched in some way, either by a new onset of an actual like mental health diagnosis exacerbation of current diagnoses or what we would call kind of affective disorders. So the based on criteria, don't meet the criteria clinically for depression, et cetera, but, but do have strong signs and signals. This extends by the way, into children. Um, the number one thing I see and I hear from colleagues is that the levels of anxiety and suicidal ideation in children is just through the roof. And it's very complicated. I think everybody would like to say it's because we haven't had the kids in school or because they're wearing masks, but it's never one factor. And it's always more than one variable. And oftentimes, by the way, the overarching variable, which a lot of parents don't want to hear is that it's actually the parent's anxiety that the child is picking up on and that it's kind of seeding some other issues. And there are not my wait times, by the way, this is for, I used to work um, in a very well-funded very kind of um, not concierge, but everyone had insurance and access to high quality like healthcare services. But the wait time for almost everybody for child psychologists, psychiatry is months. It, it's rare that I can get anybody in unless they've got active suicidal ideation for which I need to get them on a clinical hold, um, you know, quickly into services. So the, the demand is through the roof. The supply is not there. And I think a lot of the demand is going to need to be met in places that are not well equipped for it. Workplaces, I, I know every workplace of a certain size, even small businesses tend to have um, what we call EAP programs, employee assistance programs. They tend to be a poster with like a, a, a number or a website and you can try to access services. That's not going to be sufficient for what we're seeing, not just clinically, but like even if you think of yourself as completely healthy, there is gonna be this like natural nervousness kind of grief that happens coming back in either full-time face-to-face or people who have been working face-to-face -face but struggling with like staying safe. And then schools, I think schools, um, only about 40% of schools have a school-based nurse. Most of them are not full-time, they're part-time and nurses are not well-equipped themselves because it's not part of their training most nurses have had to do active shooter trainings and some things related to PTSD, but not really picking up on, you know, um, oh, Kavita's not developing in her milestones and she's been out for a couple of months. What do we need to do for her? So nurses don't have the training, not all of them. And then we don't have simply, that's not what school has been meant to be. But I think that mental health is going to have to become an integral part of what we think of as requirements for education. And you know, having worked on educational and healthcare budgets, I can tell you like, you know, healthcare always swamps a lot of the dollars in state and, and federal budgets. 
education tends to get shortchanged. And so it'll be really interesting to see um, the upcoming, I'm, I'm very curious to see uh, Biden's upcoming kind of presidential budget and how they allocate some of these things. Cause I think it'll hope, it'll be what I imagine is a signal for what we might see in private sector market investments and kind of trends overall. And um, as far as addressing mental health in the workplace, are there any specific um, programs in healthcare settings? Because, you know, those folks obviously have been just completely overwhelmed for two years. Yeah. Uh, so there have, I mean, clinical burnout or clinician burnout has been a very well studied, well known concept way before the pandemic, usually um, first manifested in changes in work hours and kind of limits to staffing ratios and work hours. And that all helped align a lot more of the industry to be, I would say, healthier. Um, but I think the version of clinician burnout that we're seeing as, as late, uh, you know, highest suicide rates in kind of the health professional setting, highest like report of substance use and abuse in healthcare settings with staff. And, and I think I have not seen most of the interventions to now, up until now have been around what I would say marginal kind of efforts, like training people to really acknowledge burnout in self and also burnout in other colleagues. But like many things, there's no magic solution, no silver bullet, if you will. And I think that um, the help res uh, HRSA, the agency that has overseen federally qualified health centers and, and training grants and, and medical education, they have a list of over $100 million in kind of wellness grants that have been deployed across the country to deal with exactly this. My cynicism about that is that having looked over many of them, that they're all kind of, again, like, you know, let's have workplace wellness seminars, let's have kind of timeouts so that surgeons can have like over time to reflect on any burnout issues they're having. But that doesn't, I, I truly, I'm, I'm just gonna be blunt, like having gone through, going through burnout myself, people just need a break. I mean, part of why we plea with the public to like get vaccinated or, you know, part of why I'm kind of stunned at like all the masks coming off, you know, in sequence while we're still dealing with case rates that 200,000 cases a day and you know 2000 plus deaths a day is that like we're not going to get a and it's not about me by the way but we're not going to give people a break like the very workforce that you and I are going to depend upon so that I can get my you know cervical cancer screening and I can reliably have like an emergency room ready to take me if I have a gallbladder that needs to come out guess what like some like those none of these places are ready for that and I really worry, like what I see a loss of is empathy and kind of sympathy. And no, nobody should feel sorry for me. I make decent money. I have job security in the entire world. I can go somewhere and get a job. But what happens when like the, you know, physician, nurse, advanced practitioner that you're looking at and that you're asking help from doesn't have empathy for you anymore. And so that's the effect of burnout that I worry about the most. And the intervention for that is way beyond a one hour seminar. And so, yeah, so fill in the blank. I don't have great solutions. I, I, it's easier for me to say things are not working than they are working. Um, but I do think it's gonna have to be something that if you're a business focused on healthcare that you're gonna have to pay attention to and put some time and money into. Uh, so uh, I think from our conversation so far, I, I already have a lot of story ideas, but, but I am wondering, you know, for folks out there who are looking for story ideas around this topic, um, what are some things that we're missing as journalists that, you know, you see on the ground uh, that would make good stories for us? Yeah, there's been, I, I think, um, I, I was trying to think about this coming into this session because I think surprise billing, even with some of the recent legislation and changes, there's been a lot of like good stories that have surfaced some of these issues that, by the way, still persist. Um, I do feel like one of the areas that I haven't seen enough attention on has been um, now that now that we're shifting from paying for everything for COVID related hospitalizations. I, I see so much kind of um, after effects. I don't even know if I can call it long COVID because the criteria um, are pretty general for long COVID, but how are we dealing with like the burden of cost of kind of post COVID, uh, you know, all of the things that we're seeing in the clinical setting, that's one kind of huge topic. The second, I think large topic really is around like the adequacy of the workforce. We've touched on, you know, the demand is so high, the supply is not there. 
and much of our work is getting shifted to advanced practitioners. And I'm not sure there are some things that I have colleagues who are absolutely equipped at handling a lot of what gets handed to them. But then there's frankly a lot of things that they probably need to ask for help, just like I ask for help from specialists when I don't quite know what I'm doing. Um, and then the third is also the nature. So much of COVID has changed, like, um, you know, having visitors in the hospital. We still see hospitals that are restricting visitors, restricting access in emergency rooms. There can't be enough written about that because I had a patient the other night, Saturday night, 96 year old, deaf, literally cannot hear, um, doesn't have, and, and Spanish speaking only. And her only daughter and granddaughter who were trying to kind of be with her, were told they can't wait with her. I understand that. We, same reason we're having a conversation about people wearing masks, but there is a point to where it's getting, it, it's not even sustainable. And, and we have many, um, even in our own clinics, we limit the number of people in the room. And so what does it mean to kind of go through a very awful healthcare experience by yourself? And that's, that continues. Oh, and then the third story, this has nothing to do with what we've been talking about, but I've been tracking, um, all the state legislation that is actually trying to counter some of the federal, uh, sorry, the state medical boards, which are trying to regulate against doctors and other health providers that propagate misinformation. And the number of state bills that kind of keep a tracker and the number of bills against the ability for boards to do that is, is pretty like mind boggling. And so we have walked into, we have always respected autonomy and authority in the practice of medicine. We've left that to medical boards, right or wrong, medical boards, medical associations. When that starts to get legislated, I actually think that's a huge red flag and a problem um, and something that we don't have, we certainly uh, will not leave. The, the effects of that go far beyond COVID. And I don't think people realize that. And we only have a couple minutes, but um, we do have a quick question from the audience yeah. um, about homebound seniors. What about their mental health? Is there anything you can say quickly about that? Yeah, I mean, it's terrible. We've done nothing. We've My 96-year-old had been homebound and isolated for two and a half years. Going to the emergency room was the only thing she had done outside of her house, and that experience didn't go well. So I think homebound people, because I have patients and persons who are much younger that are homebound for different reasons, um, and health literacy, the combination of the two have been devastating. I haven't seen any good studies on it, but I know people are working on this, but it's a good topic. For sure. Yeah, that's another avenue for stories. Um, so yeah, I think literally there are just an endless number of stories to come out of um, COVID and the medical world. Um, so, um, and, and you've been great. So thank you very much for, for you. all your insight. Um, so we have uh, coming up next, uh, James T. Medor from Newsday. He's an economics reporter, and he's going to be talking about the, um, the economic side of things. So, um, so thank you very much for for joining us today. Thank you so much, Laura and Dr. Patel, for a really informative discussion. Uh, there were a lot of good story ideas out there. So um, thank you again. Um, I'm James Medor, and I write about the economy for Newsday. And it is my pleasure to introduce our next guest, um, Mark Zandi, who is the chief economist at Moody's Analytics. And uh, Mark is no stranger to many of us journalists. Uh, he always makes time to help us explain the economy to our readers, viewers, and users. So Mark, welcome. It's nice to have you. Audience members, now is the time to send in your questions for Mark. You can do so by clicking on the chat icon at the bottom of your screen. So please start sending in your questions. And Mark, let's start by you giving us your latest economic forecast for the rest of 2022. How do you see the year shaping up and how might we end the year? Well, thanks, James. I wanna thank you and uh, everyone else for the opportunity to participate this afternoon. So thank you very much for that. Um, uh, to answer your question, I, I'm sanguine about the economic outlook. Uh, I think that Growth will slow this year from the very torrid pace that we experienced last year, but that'll bring us back to full employment. <clears throat> and while there's a fair amount of debate about what full employment is, I don't think there'll be any debate that we'll be at full employment by the end of the year. Uh, I also think that inflation will uh, moderate throughout the year. Uh, it won't be back 
to a place we feel comfortable with by year's end, but we'll be headed in that direction. Uh, and by the mid 2023, I think we'll be in a pretty good place on inflation as well. Of course, interest rates will rise. Uh, that'll be uh, necessary to ensure that the economy does kind of soft land back into full employment with the moderate inflation. I will say, you know, obviously lots of assumptions go into that. And the key one is the pandemic. I'm assuming the pandemic continues to wind down. And what I mean by that is that while it's likely we'll suffer future waves of the pandemic, each wave will be less disruptive to the healthcare system, to the economy than the previous wave. I think that, that's been our experience over the past couple of years. I think that's likely going uh, forward. So if that's the case, then I think we're, we're in a good spot. I, I will say that if I'm wrong, uh, and James, I'm rarely wrong, as you know, but if I'm wrong, uh, you know, it will be that inflation is more persistent than I'm anticipating and that the Federal Reserve is going to have to work a lot harder to get that inflation down. And if that, uh, that scenario comes to pass, then the risks of the economy, if not, I don't want to say crash land, but hard land, you know, going into 23 will, uh, will begin to rise. But the most likely scenario is, a, I think, a, a relatively sanguine one. That's terrific, Mark. A follow-up question. Um, as you know, through the pandemic, which is coming up on its second anniversary, we've seen the pandemic operate in different ways in different parts of the country, right? The pandemic was hardest in the Northeast at the very beginning. Then it really hit the Midwest. Then it went to the upper Northwest. I'm wondering the relationship, the when a region is hard hit by the pandemic, is there a correlation to its economic forecast? Or the forecast that you just gave us, is it pretty much gonna be this way throughout the entire country? Or do we see that it will moderate? We will not see the economic growth in areas that are hard hit by, the, by another surge, whatever we, you know, we have Omicron, we don't know what the next one's gonna be, but we're probably gonna have one. How does that impact the economy? Well, the, the pandemic, did have different regional economic impacts. And I, I think it more of it as urban versus non-urban. Uh, the urban areas, the big cities, uh, particularly in the Northeast, you know, New York would be the, you know, the, the epicenter. Uh, but you know, Boston all the way down to DC and then Chicago, Detroit, uh, the West, big markets on the West Coast, you know, San Francisco, LA, you know, up to uh, the Northwest Seattle, uh, those are the areas that got hit hardest. And I think that's in part because of uh, just the nature of the pandemic, you know, in urbanized areas, more people got sick and it was more disruptive to those economies. Uh, and they had to shut down or they had to be much more restrictive uh, in terms of uh, 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 masking and uh, uh, social distancing and all those things that we did to try to mitigate the fallout from the pandemic on, on us uh, in, from a healthcare perspective. So I, I think that's the biggest difference here. And if you can, you look across the country, you know, we actually put this something together called a back to normal index. And it's essentially a compilation of lots of statistics, government statistics, third party data. We index it to equal 100 on February 29th, 2020, you know, right before the pandemic hit, that was a hundred, that's normal. Nationwide, we're you know, about 92, 93%. We, at the bottom, it was 50% if you go all the way back into you know, March, April of uh, May of, of 2020. Uh, some states are all the way back. You know, many of those are more uh, rural, uh, non-urban areas in the Mountain West, parts of the Southeast. Uh, and the areas that are struggling are, are you know, the big urban areas. Uh, New York is lagging, Chicago, LA. So I think that's the biggest difference here. And again, I think it goes just to the nature of the pandemic that it hits urban areas harder than non-urban non areas. I know we have some people in the audience who write about their regional economies. I should ask you, how could they access the back to normal index? That clearly is something that people should probably be following in my profession and mm -hmm. finding out more about how it can work its way into their stories. Yeah, you can Google it. We actually work with uh, CNN. So it's on the CNN website and it's also on the Moody's website. But if you Google it, you'll get right to it. And there's a nice, we do it by state. It, it, it's a daily statistic, but we update it for public uh, use every week on Friday of every week. And so you can see, it, you know, tracks 
you know, very consistent, as you would imagine, with the economic data. So it gives you a pretty good sense of where we've been, uh, where we are, and kind of, you know, how much more we need to go before we get back to something I think we feel comfortable with. I should also ask you, as you know, we're, we're seeing many states lifting their mask requirements in public spaces. We had news out of New Jersey just a couple of days ago. Today, the New York state governor said she's lifting the indoor mask requirement tomorrow. Those kinds of actions, in, we're two years into a pandemic. Does that have much of an effect on the economy? Simply government deciding that one sector of our society will no longer have a mask mandate? Well, in the sense that I think it's symptomatic of kind of a broader reopening of the economy. I think we're all getting to a place where, you know, we're feeling this is, we just got to live with the, with the virus. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's not going away easily. It's more endemic. Uh, we just have to live with it and learn how to navigate around it. And the fact that governors in many states are, you know, pulling back on their mask mandates, I think is testimonial to that reality. And so that, you know, I think means that, you know, the economy is going to be less and less fettered by the waves of the pandemic. I, I think that's the case. I mean, I mentioned that in terms of the outlook in, in my assumptions, but I think uh, this is just, you know, one more indication that, you know, we're uh, the virus, you know, obviously we have the vaccines, we have the therapeutics, but uh, the virus itself is gone in a way that's less virulent, all good. But on top of that, we're learning how to navigate around this thing and, and work through uh, the constraints on our economy uh, as a result of the pandemic. And I think that's, uh, you know, the, the lifting of the mass mandates is, is evidence of that. Thank you so much. I, I, I want to ask you also about the changes that we've seen over the last two years that are more likely to be around five to 10 years from now, and therefore the economy will be impacted. You know, everything from how we work to how we deliver goods to people. We have seen some pretty big changes in these last two years. Some of them may be around for many more years to come. I'm wondering what ones do you think will still be around and will have an impact on how business is done in this country, how our economy operates? Well, I'll tell you, James, I think the game changer is remote work. I think this is a big deal. It's, um, it's uh, here to stay. Uh, I mean, uh, just to give you a sense of, the, of, you know, give you context, prior to the pandemic, uh, you know, roughly 5% of the workforce worked remotely. My sense is uh, in the immediate wake of the pandemic, we'll be settling in around 20% of the workforce. And that'll rise steadily over time as, you know, we figure out how to uh, empower work, remote work more effectively and technology shifts and the way we interact uh, will, will change over time uh, to take advantage of remote work. Uh, and that has, if that's the case, uh, that has enormous implications, both macroeconomic and, you know, more microeconomic. From a, you know, macroeconomic perspective, I think that it means higher rates of productivity growth, which is a great thing, a good thing. You know, it's, I think it, you know, there's a lot of debate about this and, it, and, I, and I, not every business, this is, remote work isn't for every business or for every industry, but in aggregate, I think the evidence is now mounting that, that uh, productivity growth is getting a lift from, uh, from remote work. And it's in lots of different ways, um, you know, everything from, uh, you know, less business travel. So, you know, prior to the pandemic, I traveled a lot all over the world. I have a couple hundred economists that report to me from all over the planet. And I would go visit London, and I'd go to Prague, I'd go to Dubai, I'd go to Singapore. And then I got home and then I did it again. <laughs> you know, so, and I got pretty, I thought I was pretty efficient at you know, doing work and you know, keeping abreast of things and engaged. But you know, uh, I, I didn't realize how uh, unproductive I actually was, you know, given the pandemic and now I've been you know, cemented kind of in my, in place here for a couple of years. Uh, and, you know, business travel will pick up, salespeople will go back to traveling, but I think a lot of other business people will not. And that, that by itself is a, is a, you know, game changer in terms of productivity growth. Uh, commute times, you know, that, that, that's a little tricky, you know, in terms of actually showing up in the measured productivity measures. Uh, 
but that's a welfare win, right? I mean, everyone wins if you don't have to travel an hour from, you know, I know where you live on Long Island into the, the Manhattan and back again. That's, 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 you view that as work time legitimately, and that's unproductive work time. So, you know, productivity enhancing. Here's the other thing I'd say is, I, you know, it almost feels like, um, and that might be, you know, this might be a little bit of hyperbole, feels like almost like, uh, you know, electricity, you know, when, when we got electricity, you know, a little over a century ago, factories couldn't figure out why would I use electricity? Oh, I have this turbine in the middle of the factory that's powered by water. And you want me now to power by electricity? How's that going to actually make me work any better? Well, it turns out the electricity allowed, you know, for all these different machines to be developed and set up and the factory floor changed and that dramatically improved, obviously, the productivity of factories. I think the same thing is going to happen with remote work. Right now, we're seeing remote work in the context of the existing way we work, you know, the office spaces that we have. But new companies that form, they're going to have a very different perspective on this, and they're going to, they're going to organize themselves around remote work, and that will empower all kinds of productivity gains that we can't uh, even envisage. I mean, I can go on and on, but you know, I think, and I'll give you one micro impact, and this is important for your part of the world, James, and that is, Big uh, urbanized area cities uh, that are very expensive, and obviously New York, my hometown of Philly, Boston, Chicago, LA, San Francisco, uh, they're, they're gonna be diminished by this. Not, not that they're not gonna grow, I'm not arguing that, they're gonna come back, but they're not gonna come back fast. And it's gonna take a long time to recover what was lost during the pandemic. And that's in large part because of, of, of uh, remote work. I'll, I'll end with one statistic, we collect data based on credit files. So we get uh, anonymized uh, credit file data uh, at a consumer level from uh, Equifax, the credit bureau. Uh, we can see address changes. So I can calculate the number of people that are moving from urban cores of major cities to anywhere, suburbs, exurbs, you know, rural areas. Uh, the number of people uh, that uh, net out migration from urban cores to suburbs and exurbs is about 300 on an annualized basis about 300,000 higher today than it was pre-pandemic 300k uh, and uh, here's here's an inter interesting statistic 150k of that is the New York metropolitan area the the, the, uh, the the metropolitan division so that gives you a sense of you know that 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 is a significant drag on the economy not again not that it can't grow and it will it'll come back but it will diminish growth rates and of course where those folks are going and you know where they're going they're going to atlanta they're going to almost everywhere in florida uh, austin is a big beneficiary of all those folks leaving new york and if you're leaving la san francisco you're moving into the mountain west you know boise down to phoenix those areas are getting all juiced up by this so you know it's dramatically changing uh regional economic performance and i, and I think that we're just seeing the beginning of that that's fascinating. And let me ask you a follow-up question. Um, many of the people in the audience, they cover a regional economy, not a national economy. And you just mentioned that remote work is going to be a key story for us to cover. What kinds of statistics, what kind of indicators could help reporters as they're trying to track these, these new trends in our economy, everything from remote work to out migration are there some statistics that are good to sort of follow on a monthly or quarterly basis? Well, I mentioned the, uh, the credit file data. Actually, interestingly enough, the, the uh, Postal Service is now releasing data as well. Uh, they, uh, a number of uh, academic researchers investigating the impact of remote work put in a FOIA request and the Postal Service was required to release data and it's pretty good data. Uh, it's not as good as the credit file data because it's not as granular. They can't see income levels of, of, of the peop of people. They can't see you know, the, uh, uh, exactly where they're going like I could with the credit file data, but that's pretty good data. So that, you know, that's something I think that uh, will be more and more mind going forward and something you know, uh, good to look at. Uh, the third party data, you know, one of the interesting things about the pandemic is that it, uh, it kind of um, jump-started a, a lot of efforts at companies to provide the, the information and data that they're producing uh, publicly. You know, so you, you're, all fam you're all familiar with Google and the Google mobility data, really cool data regionally that I follow very carefully, you know, daily data. 
that you can get a real insight into what you know what's going on in in a community or in an area. Uh, open table data data that's you know restaurant bookings. It's regional. You can take a really good look. Home base data that's on uh, you know uh, uh, small business uh, formation. Um, uh, you, you, there's a, there's just a whole, I mean, I, Zillow data, you know, on housing and, and housing finance, uh, the government agencies have also gotten a lot better, you know, providing information. So you can get really cool data on uh, mortgage lending and mortgage credit quality from Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, the FHA, you know, down to a granular regional level. So, it, you know, the problem here isn't, not enough data. It's just way too much data. There's like so much stuff out there that's really very interesting and providing real insight. And, you know, I think, uh, you know, a real opportunity for journalists uh, to, to mine. That's terrific. Thank you, Mark. Uh, I'm going to switch gears here for a moment, but I just want to remind the audience that if you have a question for Mark, please submit it through the chat function, which is at the bottom of your screen. Mark, I wanted to ask you about the aging U.S. population, because that's something that we've heard a lot about with the pandemic. Uh, we were aging before the pandemic, and unfortunately, many of the fatalities are with our older population, and we're not seeing birth rates that, like we saw after World War II. I'm wondering the impact on the workplace of this aging workforce and the great resignation. Is that sort of an anomaly? Or is the great resignation like remote work, something that we're going to live through for a number of years to come? Yeah, the demographic uh, impacts of the pandemic are significant, very significant. In fact, we just got a sense of that in the last day or two, census released more data uh, on population by age group in uh, 2020, 2021. And what they found was that uh, the uh, there are many more fewer people over the age of 75 than they thought, about a million less. Uh, and that goes to, you know, obviously what you said, it's the older age groups that really suffered the most here in terms of the, uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, the, 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 uh, the fatalities involved with the pandemic. Uh, but we, we also learned, and this is more of a positive note, that Bursts didn't actually get hit. They got hit a little bit, but not nearly as much as was feared. You know, there was a fear that the pandemic would cause people to stop having babies. And they had, they, you know, we're in a secular decline in terms of fertility rates, but the fertility rate didn't get hit bad, as badly as thought. And that probably goes to all the government support that was provided during the pandemic because, you know, people had the, were okay financially because they got stimulus checks and unemployment insurance and you know, rental assistance and that kind of thing. So they kept having babies. So that was a positive. But on net, you know, population growth has really slowed, come to a standstill. Uh, and the other obvious, really critical for the economy demographic uh, uh, result of the pandemic is the uh, collapse in foreign immigration, right? We, 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 our economy relies very heavily on foreign immigrants uh, to power labor force growth and ultimately jobs and economic activity. It, you know, immigration was coming in pretty dramatically before the pandemic because of policies under the Trump administration, but the pandemic did a number on, on immigration as well. So you're right, uh, you know, the population growth has slowed very sharply and, you know, prospects going forward are diminished by, you know, what the pandemic has done here. And that has enormous implications for labor force growth. And the, it, it goes to the, the idea that, you know, labor markets are going to be perennially tight going forward. You know, they'll, they'll, it'll ebb and it'll flow with the business cycle, <clears throat> but cutting through the ups and downs in the economy, we're going to have a, a, a perennially a tight labor market. By the way, that was going to be the case even without the pandemic, just the aging of the boom, my generation, the boomer generation was aging out of, of the workforce. And that, that meant that, you know, we're going to see these labor shortages anyway, but it's all been exacerbated by the, uh, you know, by the pandemic. Um, on the great resignation, you know, that's, um, in, in my view, that's largely a result of the pandemic. So sort of my way of thinking about it is, you know, you go back a year ago, vaccines, the economy reopened, every, it felt like every business in the country put up a help wanted sign at the same time. We had 11 million openings. You see all those openings and you're in a job, you're not really, eh, I don't really like this job. You know, I don't like the pay. I don't like the hours. I don't, I have to commute along distance to get to the work. 
So, and why am I doing that when there's, you know, open job position here down the street or, you know, across the way here? So I think the dramatic increase all of a sudden in open positions caused people to quit, you know, and, and, and also they, they felt like they had a little bit of time. It wasn't like they needed a job immediately because of all the government support, right? They got a lot of cash sitting in the bank account. We know the excess saving numbers are, you know, large, particularly for high income households, but across all income groups. And I, that's allowed people to take time to, you know, find the right job. They could quit. They didn't have to take an immediate job right away. They could find, you know, it could take some time to find another job. So, you know, I, my sense is that as we get through the pandemic, people don't get sick or are fearful of getting sick. You go back to work. The government support is fading now. We have, you know, the last bit of that came with the American Rescue Plan about a, about a year ago. And, uh, you know, I think uh, the, quid, the rates of uh, the, the open positions will come in. They've already peaked. They'll come in and the quits will uh, come in as well. Having said all of that, I do think quit rates, that's the percent of labor force that quits their job, which is, you know, you know, incredibly high every month. People don't realize the churn in the labor market, but that's going to remain elevated going forward, in part because of the tight, perennially tight labor market I described, but also in part because of remote work. You know, that really allows people to, you know, move from one job to another much more easily because the transaction costs involved in moving are much lower, right? Because you, you don't have to move to, to take that job. So we have a question from Nancy. Um, she's asking, how do you interpret the over 45 unemployment numbers in the quit rate when the majority of employers, they're all courting Generation Z? They're not courting older workers. What would you say to Nancy? Well, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not sure what she's referring to. The, if these are older pe- folks over the age of 45, and she's saying... Right, what? she's saying, she's asking the the unemployment numbers for people who are over 45, yeah. how does that relate to the quit ratio and the mm-hmm. fact that employers seem to not be looking for older workers? They're looking for Generation Z and younger. Yeah, I, I to be frank, I haven't looked at the quit rate for folks over the age of 45. I, I, I wasn't even aware that data was available by age. That's interesting. I, I didn't know that was available. I mean, what I do know is that the... Uh, the, uh, the, the dramatic increase in quits has been among uh, young workers, low wage workers working in industries that have been hit hardest by the pandemic. They're on the front lines like uh, leisure hospitality, restaurants, other retail, recreational activities, personal services, education, healthcare, those kind of low wage. And that's where the labor shortages have been most severe. And that's where the wage growth has accelerated the most. In fact, you can, in my view, the best measure of wages is produced by the Atlanta Fed. They have this so-called Atlanta Fed wage track where they follow the same worker over time. So it it, it corrects for all the biases that exist because of compositional issues and all the other, most of the other wage statistics. And the, the other benefit of the Atlanta Fed data is that you can look at wage growth by a different cut of the labor market, one of which is by age, another is by region, another is by uh, where in the wage distribution you are. And you can see that uh, overall wage growth has accelerated a bit, but all of the acceleration of wage growth has been for folks in the bottom half of the wage distribution, particularly in the bottom quartile of the distribution, bottom 25%. Folks in the top part of the wage distribution, their wage growth has not meaningfully accelerated. And also you can look at by age, if you look at by age, all of the wage acceleration is people between the age of 16 and, you know, in their 20s, the folks that are, I, I looked at 55 and over, I didn't look at 45 and over, 55 and over, actually wage growth has decelerated for that group. So all the action, you know, or most of the action, you know, most of the tightness in the labor market are for young workers, less educated in those frontline industries. Uh, and, and that's, that's, it varies across the country, but particularly in, the Northeast and the mountain in the West Coast, where the pandemic has been most disruptive, and we've seen you know the most uh, you know people getting sick and unable to go to work. I should ask you as a follow up. You mentioned healthcare, and you have written quite a bit about the fact that healthcare has become a very important part of the overall economy. In many pla- in many places, it's replaced, for example, manufacturing. 
uh, where I live, healthcare is the single biggest growth factor in employment. When we're seeing healthcare under such pressure, and Dr. Patel told us about healthcare workers really at their wits' end, they need a break, many of them are quitting. That strain that our healthcare industry is under, how does that impact the overall economy? Well, uh, you're right. I mean, uh, healthcare has become, I think, the second large, it depends how you define an industry, but the, it, it, broadly speaking, the second largest employer in the country after you know, education, uh, you know, K through 12, higher education. And that the, the, uh, the, uh, the hospital uh, is in many communities, far and away the largest employer in those communities. And it's important also because it, uh, the healthcare system hires people of, of all wages, you know, across the skill and, and educational attainment uh, spectrum. So it's a, a employer that's you know critical to the, a well-functioning economy. And of course, the healthcare system is under tremendous pressure for well, lots of reasons. It was under pressure even before the pandemic hit, right? Because it was adjusting to you know uh, different efforts to kind of rein in the growth and the cost of healthcare, and that created you know lots of changes and dislocations in the healthcare system as that as it tried to adjust to the changes in, in government policy. Uh, but the pandemic just, you know, complicates things enormously. So, you know, that's a that's a good point that, you know, it, it's going to take a while for the healthcare system to kind of uh, get itself back together on the other side of the pandemic. I, I don't think that's next year. That could be five, 10 years down the road. And that means that, you know, that major engine of economic growth, the hospital that's sitting in the center of your community, you know, may not be the quite the engine that it was pre-pandemic. It'll take some time to rev back up. That's terrific, thank you. Uh, we have a question from Christine. Christine is wondering if you could comment on the relationship between increasing wages and the fact that we're having increased inflation and inflation looks like it's gonna continue to grow at least a little bit until the Fed acts. And are there particular industries that are affected by this phenomenon where you have increasing wages, they're also facing inflation? Yeah, let me just say there are a number of reasons for the higher inflation, all of them go back to the pandemic and the disruptions created by the pandemic. At the top of the list is the supply chain disruptions. Uh, second on the list is what's going on in energy markets. At third on the list and towards the bottom is this, uh, the labor shortages and the higher wages, because this is mostly for those industries I just described, the ones that have been you know, on the front lines where workers you know, are interfacing with people and where they're more prone to get sick or fearful of getting sick. So that's where most of the wage growth has been. And, and that's in those industries, those businesses have been passing through the higher wage costs in the form of higher prices. But in the rest of the economy, that has not been the case. So wage growth has not been the uh, most significant factor behind the acceleration in inflation to date. Now, having said that very quickly, because I know we're running out of time, uh, that's the concern that if, you know, the wage growth becomes broader, acceleration wage growth becomes broader based, outpaces productivity growth in a consistent way, then you get into kind of a wage price dynamic cycle, vicious cycle, uh, the wage so-called wage price spiral. And that's a problem. And that's, you know, when the Fed will have to go on the war path and, you know, step on the brakes and raise interest rates much more aggressively. That's a worry, that's a concern. I don't view that as a major issue at this point in time. That's terrific, thank you, Mark. Unfortunately, we have run out of time. I wanna thank you um, for your insights, Mark. You've given us a number of good stories to pursue and also some data points and some sources of information. So thank you, this has been very helpful. To the audience, please check out sebu.org for a listing of future events, including our monthly virtual training sessions and interviews with legendary business journalists. Thank you to the Commonwealth Fund for sponsoring this event and for its steadfast support of Cebu's educational endeavors. On behalf of Cebu, thank you for spending some time with us this afternoon and enjoy the rest of your week.